to the first lab for ECE 3640. This lab covers uh, the basics of MATLAB, and a lot of you have probably used MATLAB previously. Um, so this lab is just to get everybody on the same page and to highlight a few of the things that um, I typically use in MATLAB. Um, so let's just jump in. Um, maybe, maybe this will all be a review to you. Um, if you would like to, if you feel like you're a power user on MATLAB, uh, you can go ahead to the end of the slideshow and look at the assignments. Um, I'm going to go ahead and step through a few of the things, and I'll try and go through this pretty quickly. Um, there will be a few places where I'll pause to uh, switch over to MATLAB and actually show some MATLABing going on real time here during the course of this. But let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so here's an outline of what I would like to cover here in this first lab, and I'll probably break this up into several different recordings. Um, <clears throat> so this is a class on what I'm going to call digital signal processing. It's an introduction to digital signal processing, or what we might call discrete time signal processing. And so we're going to work with signals, and so we'll begin by learning about a couple of different kinds of signals. Um, I've got three kinds identified here, audio signals, images are also signals, and then videos. Um, these are all, these are three different kinds of signals that we will use throughout the semester to, um, to do programming on and to manipulate these kinds of signals, and just to get some exposure to doing some signal processing. So in class we learn about the theory, um, in these programming assignments, I hope to put the theory to work to actually do things. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about, uh, sin since um, audio, images, videos, all of these things can be more than one-dimensional objects uh, when we think about storing them in computer memory. So uh, we'll need to um, talk about multidimensional arrays in MATLAB. And then later in a subsequent um, lab, we'll talk about multidimensional arrays in C. So, so um, just as a background, this first lab is an introduction to MATLAB, and all of the other labs will have C programming components to them. We will use MATLAB as the main interface to, to the C program, uh, and we, we do this for several reasons. One is because we don't want to have to write in C um, code to read and write images and audio and video because often these things are in a highly compressed format. So built into MATLAB already are um, various codecs so that we can very easily read and write videos and images and audio data um, from their native formats in their compressed file format. We'll read them into MATLAB and then we'll write them out to a, a generic um, file format that we can then read into our C programs and do the processing in C, and then we'll write the, um, write some files back out using C. We'll read those output files back into MATLAB and look at the results. So MATLAB is at the start and the at the, the beginning and the end of our programming in C. Um, we're, we're going to use MATLAB for um, uh, visualization. It's an excellent visualization tool, but I think and it's also a great computational engine, um, but we're going to do most of our number crunching in C because it forces us to think about the problems and really understand the algorithms at a much lower level. So um, that's the philosophy behind using, you know, the way we're going to use MATLAB in C. Um, and then, as you can see uh, here, we're going to talk about uh, three of three or four of the different uh, display capabilities that MATLAB has built in. We'll look at plots. So this is basically making plots of one-dimensional uh, one signals, like audio. We'll look at the um, image command for making plots of images. And then uh, we can also use the image command to um, look at frames in video. Um, if we want to watch the video real time, we can go out and use uh, the uh, you know, tools that are available in the operating system for viewing videos. And then finally, we'll wrap this up with um, a look at the Fast Fourier Transform function in MATLAB and the Spectrogram function for making time frequency plots. And we'll illustrate those things as we get to them. 
Okay, so the first thing to talk about in MATLAB is how do we get help? <clears throat> We're always going to want to to know how to use certain functions, and um, there's there's a lot of help built into MATLAB to help us. So uh, the first thing to know is there's a there's a function called help or a keyword called help. So if we switch over to MATLAB, um, let's see a function. Uh, if we want to know how to use the convolution function, is called conv. We could just type help and conv, and it will put up a little help screen here and tell us how we can call this and what are the all the different arguments that we can use. Um, if we don't even know that there is a convolution function available in MATLAB, but we know that we want to do convolution, we can use the look for. And what this does is it goes out and searches through all of the documentation and looks for the word convolution and then prints, prints out um, all of the functions that have this convolution uh, term in the help. And MATLAB is very big and it it's taking a long time to do the search, so I think I'm just going to not wait for that to come back. There's a variety of other things that are listed here. I'm not going to go into each one of them. You can type doc, and that will bring up a documentation system. Help desk is another way to do that. You can go to the internet. You can talk to people. Um, there's all kinds of ways you can get help um, in MATLAB. So I guess what I would encourage you to do if you're working through and, you, and you're not sure how to do something, um, do a quick search or get help from someone else and uh, so that you can make progress quickly. Okay, here's an example um, of using help I put into the slides. Um, if you type help rel op, uh, this shows you all of the relational operators available in MATLAB and talks about how, how they're used. Some other useful commands. Um, PWD shows the present working directory. Um, DIR and LS both list all the files in, this, in the current directory. CD and CHDIR change directories. What lists all the M files in the current directory? I'll just go over and cancel out of this. So if I type what, um, these are all of the .m files in the current directory. PWD, this shows the current directory and so on. <coughs> Uh, there's there's a whole bunch of other things here. Type test. Um, if I want to see what um, is in this file called oscope, I can say type oscope, and it will print the contents of that file to the screen. Um, this is useful for um, all sorts of functions, um, even MATLAB's provided functionality. So, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Type conv. So when you call conv in MATLAB, it executes this function, and this is the contents of the function. So you can see what's going on there. If you're, uh, one, one of the reasons this is useful is because you can see how MATLAB experts who write these um, built-in functions, how they go about doing their programming. Uh, let's see. Uh, all sorts of other things. And as we go into the examples, um, I'll try and illustrate some of these things. But, but I, um, I would recommend that you become familiar with all of the uh, commands shown here. Okay, next let's talk about signal input and output in MATLAB. <clears throat> so as I said before, there are many different kinds of signals. Uh, we're basically going to focus on three types, audio signals, images, and video. And um, I've, I have here on this slide several examples. Um, you can see here um, uh, an audio signal consists of uh, a signal that's fluctuating as a function of time. So t is the independent variable, and the amplitude is the dependent variable. Um, audio, so I, I would characterize audio as a one-dimensional signal. It, um, if it has one channel, we call it monaural. If it's uh, an, a stereo audio, uh, it would have two channels, one for the left and one for the right speaker. And uh, that would be a two-channel audio signal, but it's still a one-dimensional signal. It's still just a function of time. Um, images, if it's a grayscale image, uh, it's a two-dimensional signal because it's a function of uh, x position and y position from the image origin. Um, 
and the number of channels would be 1 because it's grayscale. If, on the other hand, if, if it were an RGB color image, it, uh, it, it's actually a, a three, uh, a composite of three images. This example at the bottom illustrates that. Um, here we see the RGB composite, and I've also drawn um, the red channel, green channel, and blue channel. So this one over here on the left is actually a, a composite of three different color images where each one is a one channel image. This is a one channel of red, one channel of green, one channel of blue. But the R RGB image is a function of X, Y, and it also has three channels then. So that's for a color image. Similar sorts of things hold for video. So if we have grayscale video, this uh, um, film strip here that's shown on the right is meant to illustrate that video, at least for grayscale video, each frame consists of a grayscale image where you have X and Y, and then um, uh, each frame uh, or successive frames are uh, separated in time, so t you have time as a deep and independent variable. And then if you had a color video, um, you have two dimensions, X, Y, you have another dimension for time, <clears throat> and then you also have three channels, so it's like a composite of three uh, of these um, grayscale videos, one for each color, red, green, and blue. So one of the things we need to be able to do is to load these types of media, these kinds of signals, into MATLAB and write them back out. So the next few slides um, give examples um, of these things. So um, at the top of each of these slides, we will see code that you could execute in MATLAB showing how you would uh, get information about the media, media file and how you would read that data into MATLAB. Um, let, let's just step through this first example, and I, I probably won't go through all of the examples in as much detail. So for the case of audio, um, there is a function called audio info that you can use to get information about a file, an, an audio file. So for example, a wave, uh, wave files are common, MP3s are also um, acceptable here. But this will give you a, a, a bunch of different information. So for example, um, the first two commands here are audio info, and I store the return result, which is a structure, into this variable called AI. And then I display that in the command window. And, and uh, I've copied what, I, what shows in the command window into this slide. So you can see that it has a file name. You can see it's uncompressed. Number of channels is 1. You can see the sample rate is 44.1 thousand samples per second. You can see the total number of samples and the duration. This would be in seconds. So one of the ways you can get duration is by taking the total number of samples and dividing by the sample rate in samples per second, which gives you the total number of samples. Also, each um, sample is represented by a 16-bit signed integer, and so uh, that, also, that information is also stored in the file header. There's a function called audio read, which then will read in um, the wave data. Uh, in this case, um, I'm passing in some extra arguments here. Um, I'm, I only want the first 10 seconds of audio, so I pass in uh, this extra argument, which says start at sample 1 and end at sample, well, I guess I'm only reading in 9 seconds, because I start at um, at the first second and I go to the tenth second, I multiply that by the sample rate to convert that into number of samples, and then it reads that in to the variable x, and it also reads in the sample rate into the variable fs. Uh, then, then I execute a few other commands here um, to make a plot. The plot is shown here. Sorry, the, the font is rather small. But if you look at the x-axis, it's scaled so that um, you see true time here in seconds, and uh, the y-axis is the amplitude of the signal. And then you can put fancy labels on if you want to make a pretty plot. And if you want to print it, you can use the print command, and you have to give it the uh, name of the driver to use when it's making a pl uh, the print. In this case, it's going to create a PNG file. And then you can include uh, those types of files into reports, and uh, print those on a printer. So uh, that's what's going on here. So that's taking a signal from a file, 
with a certain file format, loading it into MATLAB. On the next slide, we go the other direction, and we create a signal in MATLAB, and we write that out to an audio file. So in this case, I select the sample rate to be 8,000 samples per second. I create a time vector. Uh, it looks like it's one half second long. And then I generate a cosine wave with amplitude 0.9 and frequency 110 hertz and save that in the variable x. Then I call audio write. I give it the name of the file. I tell it what variable to write out and then tell it to use the sample rate of 8,000. Oh, incidentally, back over here, um, there are some built-in commands for sending sound from variables in the MATLAB workspace to the speaker. So, for example, if you wanted to hear what was in this file called siren.wave, you could load it into MATLAB using this command, and then you could type sound sc xfs, and that would send that to the speaker, and you could actually then hear what it sounds like. I won't bother doing that right now. Okay, moving along. So that's a little bit about um, reading in audio signals. By the way, if the, um, let's just do this uh, as an example. So if I type XFS, uh, what's the name of that file? Okay, so I just read in the audio data from this file called flute22.wave into the variable x. Let's see what the sample rate is. It looks like it's 22,000 samples per second, roughly. And um, I could make a plot. And this shows what that looks like. If you wanted to hear that, we could do sound SCXFS. Okay, so I'll turn the volume down. Um, once you, once you um, enter sound SC, I'm still hearing that. Um, Once you enter sound SC, um, it's going to play to the end of the file. So there's no way to do like a control C and break out of that. So just be aware of that. Um, let's see. Next. Images. Okay, so um, images are two dimensional um, signals. And uh, we can read those into MATLAB as well and display those on the screen. This shows an example of how you might do that. So there's this file called cameraman.tiff. Uh, we use the imread command to read that image into a MATLAB variable in the workspace called x. And then um, I display that using the image command. And then I use the image sc command. So just want to compare those, and, I, and then you, you're seeing here uh, what those two things look like. So image just displays the image um, as is. Image SC will scale the image. Um, in this case, you can see uh, that we get a more pleasing image from the scaled um, version. Um, axis image uh, makes the pixels in the image squares, so it displays uh, correctly. If you don't do that, um, then it will display them as rectangles. I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Uh, actually, before I do this, let me show you what happens. Um, if you type whose, it shows you all the variables in your workspace. And if I want to clear all of them, I'll just say clear all. And now there are no variables in the workspace. So um, x is equal to... Okay, so here is your basic <clears throat> uh, cameraman image. 
and uh, this shows you that the pixels in the image are rectangles actually and they are adjusted according to the size of the figure window but if you type axis image no matter how big the figure window is it rescales the pixels so that they are square and you see an undist undistorted image also the default color map um, is what you're seeing here. Uh, if you want to see this as a grayscale image, you need to change the color map. So we do that by uh, color map gray. And there are various other color maps. Color map jet. And there's a whole bunch of built-in ones. You can even define your own. So um, just wanted to point out that all those different functions are available. So that's reading images into the workspace. We can also read images or write images out. Uh, in this case, there, um, I'm using a built-in function called DFT matrix to create a 16 by 16 array. And then I extract, it's complex, so I extract the real and the imaginary parts. And I concatenate them side by side. So I, I now have a 16 by 32 image. Um, you can see it. I've plotted it here in the figure window using the jet color map. So you can see what that looks like. But remember, this is really just a grayscale image. So the image that's actually written out to the file is this little one that is shown here. All right. So, so we can read images in from media f formatted files. They could be JPEGs. They could be PNGs, TIFFs, GIFs, whatever you want. We can also create images in MATLAB and write them out to image files. Uh, the previous example worked with a grayscale image. Um, this example just simply shows uh, the same sort of thing with a color image. So here I'm reading a color image in. This one is called coloredchips.png, and I'm creating uh, extracting the red, green, and blue channels and showing what those look like here. <clears throat> um, all right, I'm going to move on. Uh, we can do the same sort of thing with uh, color. Uh, we can create a color image. Uh, the thing to notice, uh, one of the things to notice here as we sl slide through these examples, is in the black and white case, Notice that the image that we're working with is 256 pixels, 256 rows, by 256 columns. And each, so, so this is basically a two-dimensional array. And every element in that array contains a number. Uh, in this case, you can see they're unsigned uh, integers with 8 bits. So this is a number between 0 and 255, um, at which, which indicates the grayscale intensity. Um, down here, when we get to the color images, notice the size of the array is 391 rows by 518 columns, so it's rectangular, and then it, and it's by three. So this is actually a three-dimensional array where that third dimension has only three um, slices. There's one slice for the red channel, one for the green, one for the blue. And that same thing holds here as well. Um, we have a 16 by 16 by 3 image, or array in MATLAB, which represents a color image. <clears throat> OK, so we've talked about audio. We've talked about images. Uh, now let's move on and talk about videos. Videos um, can be three-dimensional if they're grayscale images. In this case, you would have an index for the row and the column that that identifies a pixel and then each pixel has a time series in it um, and so uh, to in, so we would have a row column and then a frame index to index one pixel in one frame uh, for a color video we would actually have a four-dimensional object uh, one for row and column one for the color frame that or plane that we're talking about and then the, the fourth uh, in dimension is for the time index. Which frame are we talking about? Um, and as I mentioned here, video files can be very, very large. I mean, imagine, imagine a feature-length movie. Um, 
So typically we will work with videos one frame at a time rather than reading the whole entire movie into RAM all at once. Um, MATLAB has built in some video reading capabilities and video writing capabilities. In this case, it's a little bit more complicated than the simple um, single commands we used for reading and writing audio and images. Um, for reading videos, we use this uh, function called Video Reader. Uh, it returns an object which then we can read frames from. If you just say read object, it will read the entire video into memory and put it in this variable called x. Um, if on the other hand you say uh, read object comma 20, this reads in the 20th frame of the video. So here um, uh, you can see uh, what I've done here is uh, from starting on line 8 in this MATLAB script, I uh, extracted the number of frames uh, this object is a structure and you can access the elements of the structure using the dot in MATLAB just like you do in C. So one of the uh, structure elements is number of frames. So I return that into this variable n frames and then I loop over each of the frames. I read that frame into the variable y in the workspace and then I uh, make an image of that so that uh, you can actually um, sit and look at the image or, or look at the video in MATLAB one frame at a time. Uh, one of the other things, uh, let's see, where is it that I do this? Oh, well, yeah, I do an F print and show the um, sizes of the videos. Notice that when I read in the whole video all at once, it tells me the number of rows in each frame, the number of columns in each frame, the number of color channels, and then the total number of frames in the video sequence. In this case, there's 141 frames. Um, if this video were captured at 30 frames per second, this is almost a five second video. Also notice that when I read in a single frame, uh, look at the dimension of the object that's input. It's number of rows by number of columns by three color channels. So there's no time information when you read in just a single frame. So a single frame is a three dimensional object an entire video sequence is a four-dimensional object. And you can create videos as well. This is an example. Uh, you could run this code if you wanted to. Um, I will go ahead and um, show you what it looks like. It's an MP4. assuming that this computer knows how to load it. Well, um, I'm not going to wait for this. I'm not using my own desktop computer. I'm using another computer to record this. So some of these things have been untested. All right, moving ahead. Multidimensional arrays. Um, as we have seen, uh, different kinds of signals are have different shapes and different number of dimensions and so on. MATLAB has a uh, multidimensional array capability built in and um, so here on this slide I'm showing uh, a couple of examples. Uh, th there are some built-in functions in this case um, zeros and ones are used to construct a row vector and a column vector. So the first argument is the number of rows. The second argument is the number of columns. Uh, RAND is another built-in function that you can use to construct in MATLAB um, multidimensional arrays. Um, <coughs> row vectors and column vectors and two-dimensional matrices are fairly easy to visualize. They're just tables of numbers. A three-dimensional object or a three-dimensional array. Uh, this would represent like a color image um, because there are three color channels. Um, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to visualize uh, what a three-dimensional object is, but you can it's basically a, a collection of two-dimensional objects, two-dimensional arrays. A, a four-dimensional array 
um, so, it, it, stepping back to 3D, sometimes the third dimension is called a, a page or a slab. And um, if that's the case, if, if that third dimension is a page, then a four-dimensional array could be um, represented as rows, columns, pages, and books. So, for example, um, you might have a very large table. It's a four-dimensional table. Um, each page in a book represents uh, a two-dimensional array. All of the pages in a given book represent a three-dimensional array. And if you have multiple books, that's the fourth dimension. Maybe you've got five volumes. <clears throat> so that's your fourth dimension. And then five-dimensional five arrays, six-dimensional arrays, these things can all be accommodated. Um, here's an example showing how you could construct a three-dimensional array in MATLAB. Uh, this basically uses the RAND function and says, please return to me uh, uniform random numbers between 0 and 1. And I would like the return array to have two rows, five columns, and then six pages. Uh, you can see those things here. After, at, at, when I get those random numbers, I multiply them by 10, and then I take the floor, so it rounds towards 0. Um, here I'm also showing n, the number of dimensions, and then the size of the resulting array. And you can see that the number of dimensions is 3. Here are the dimensions. It's two rows, five columns, six pages. And then here, here this is how MATLAB displays multidimensional arrays. It displays them two dimensions at a time. So these are the two dimensions in page number one, the two dimensions in page number two, page three, and so on. So, so and as I show here at the bottom of the page, you can create uh, four-dimensional arrays, five-dimensional arrays, and so on. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this one uses cat or concatenation to construct a three-dimensional array. So basically I make um, A, B, C, and D are two-dimensional arrays and then I concatenate them together um, along the third dimension using uh, the cat function, which is a built-in function in MATLAB. Uh, there's another function called uh, that replicates a matrix. It's called repmat. Um, here I'm taking the 3x3 three three identity matrix, and I'm replicating it once in rows, runs, once in columns, and then four times in pages. And so basically I get four pages of 3x3 three three identity matrices. And this can be extended to four and five dimensions and so on. Uh, reshaping is another technique for um, constructing multidimensional arrays. In this example, I take the integers between 1 and 48, and I create a four-dimensional array. Um, each page in this array has two rows, three columns. There are two pages and four books. So, so um, if you wanted to see a particular element, you would reach onto the shelf and pull off a particular book. Then you would open up to either the first page or the second page, and then you would look at either the f in one of the rows and in one of the columns, and that's how you would look up an element in this four-dimensional array. But this example is interesting because it shows you how MATLAB uh, stores consecutive elements in a multidimensional array. So notice that on in book one, page one, row one, column one is the first element. And then it puts the second element, so the next element in memory, from MATLAB's perspective, is in the second row, first column. Then, then second row, I'm sorry, first row, second column, second row, second column, first row, third column, second row, third column, and so on. So MATLAB actually stores um, elements in memory in, the or in, in column order. Uh, and this is actually a little bit unfortunate because when we go over to C, C stores them in a different order. Um, yeah, as I say here, the leftmost subscript varies fastest as elements are accessed in memory. And that's the opposite of C. In C, it's the rightmost uh, subscript that varies fastest as elements are ac accessed in memory. 
So what that means is as we're creating an interface between a media file, bringing that media file into MATLAB, and then sending that back out so that we can load that into C, we have to actually restructure that matrix in MATLAB before we write it back out because C, we don't want to have to do that in C. Um, we could, but we would rather not do that. Okay, um, I think this is just a summary slide showing that uh, we can read in various types of signals. You can read in audio, and notice that in this example, um, I have a monaural audio signal. I also have a stereo audio signal. When I display the size of that signal, notice that it shows me it's so many samples long. This is the number of rows. And then it has two columns, which means it's a two-channel audio signal. So it's uh, stereo audio. Cameraman, we already know that's a grayscale image. It's 256 by 256. Colored chips, that's a color image. So it has three color channels. And then this video called Xylophone NP4 is a color video. So there are three color channels, and there's 141 frames. In a, I don't have an example of this, but in a black and white video, um, it would be, suppose Xylophone were a black and white video, or grayscale, it would be 240 rows, 320 columns, by 341 frames. This color dimension would just simply not be there. Okay, so that's a little background on constructing multidimensional arrays in MATLAB, but what about manipulating those kinds of objects? So um, first let's talk about setting and getting elements. So um, uh, this can be done very easily. We just uh, use parentheses after the name of the array. And then if it's a one-dimensional array, we can just put in one subscript. If it's a two-dimensional array, we use two subscripts, as you see here. So the first subscript is the row. The second subscript is the column. Um, if we have a three-dimensional object, that third dimension is the page that we want to deal with. If there's a four-dimensional object, um, you know, it, it's just a simple extension of the two-dimensional and three-dimensional ideas. Uh, note that uh, the the values that you use to access the elements don't have to be hard-coded numbers. They can be variables. And we will use variables when we put things in loops. We'll use for loops to loop over all the elements in an array, for example. We'll have to use variables to access the elements. MATLAB provides another very convenient way to access the elements uh, of multidimensional arrays. Um, I should note here that all of the expressions that you see um, here on this slide can be used on either side of an equal sign. If they appear on the left side, then we are assigning into those elements in the array. If they appear on the right side, then we're using those, um, we're accessing those elements of the array. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at a few of these examples. So um, the thing to concentrate here on here is the use of the colon operator. So in a one-dimensional array, uh, this example here shows that we are accessing elements 1 through 14,000 in this array called X. Another built-in uh, capability is the use of this uh, keyword called end. So next we're, we're accessing sample number or element number 14,000 all the way to the end of the array. So the colon operator basically does an expansion and says um, access all of the elements that are referred to between this starting index and this stopping index. And so here we have starting index 14,000, and then we go to the end of the array. Um, over here we can also specify a step size or a stride as we're accessing the elements of memory. So this, and this access is every other element. Start, starts at element 1, and then, then accesses element number 3 next, and then element 5, and 7, and so on. In two-dimensional arrays, we can just extend these um, indexing techniques to both uh, of the arguments of the array. So this would access um, elements on rows 30 through 35, and in columns 70 through 75. So this then accesses a submatrix 
of this larger two-dimensional mat matrix X. We can put uh, a comma delimited list in. If we don't want to use the colon operator, we can just access specific um, indexes. So this accesses ele elements on rows 30, 23, and 99. These do not have to be in any order. It will reorder them um, when it returns the answer. Um, so there's that. Uh, and then this access, this shows that you can string together uh, the use of the colon and the comma. So this then will access um, column 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 70, 75, 80, 85, and so on, all the way to the end of the array. Moving on, in the three-dimensional case, if we want to access all of the rows and all of the columns, but we want to only to access page number three, we can do that just using the colon operator without any other arguments around. So when, when the colon appears by itself, that's like saying all. Give me all of the rows, all of the columns, and then page number three. Uh, we can extend that in the fourth dimension. We have all of the rows, all of the columns, all of the pages, and I want book 121, or this is the 121th frame in a color video. Um, we can, uh, in, a, in this four-dimensional example, this says, I want pixel at index 100, uh, row 100, column 200. I want color 3, so this is RGB. That would be the blue channel. And then this says, give me all of the frames. So this, this would allow us to take a look at what happens in a single pixel, a single color channel, over all time. I can illustrate that um, a little later on. Another very useful um, capability is uh, when we apply the colon operator to a multidimensional array. Let me go over here and show you what, what happens in this case. So if I say x is equal to um, reshape 1 to 12, and let's make this 4 by 3, so 4 rows, 3 columns. So we can see that uh, what MATLAB does is it fills up the first column, and then it fills up the second column, fills up the third column. If I say x colon, it vectorizes the entire array, and it does it in column order. So you can see that it extracted the first column, and it stacked that on top of the second column, and then stacked that on top of the third column, and so on. If I transpose x, now notice that we're increasing across the rows because I transposed the matrix. And now if I apply the colon operator, again, it reads down the columns. So I have 1, 5, 9, 2, 6, 10, 3, 7, 11, and so on um, when we vectorize this object. And this can also be done with three-dimensional arrays, four-dimensional arrays, and so on. Um, two other very useful things uh, that will be very handy for us and will allow us to avoid writing lots of for loops are uh, squeeze and permute. So what do these things do? Let me um, uh, I'm going to say I'm going to read all of the frames. Oops, uh, end dims. Yes. Uh, so this is a four-dimensional object, and we can see that it's um, three, 240 by 320 by 3. So um, let, let's just take a look at some things here. What if I say x, I want all of the rows, all of the columns, I want the red channel, and um, I want to look at frame 100 in this video sequence. The thing I want you to observe is notice that that returns a um, it, it returns the red channel which is a two, 240 by 320 image. Um, 
if I had said give me all of the color channels, it would be 240 by 320 by 3. Now, if we apply, um, let's suppose we want um, row number 10. I want all of the columns. I would like, um, let's see, I will, I will take all of the colors and I will, well, I'm sorry, I'll take all of the colors and I'll take all of the times. Uh, look at the size of what is returned. It's 1 by 320 by 3 by 141. And if I wanted to look at this as an image, I can't do that because image only allows a three-dimensional object. So uh, now, now take a look at what happens when we squeeze this. Squeezing basically eliminates um, dimensions where uh, there's only one uh, index. So it eliminated that first index. I still can't make an image from this because it's not shaped right. Image expects there to be three color planes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to permute what's left. I'm going to take that and I'm going to permute it. And I'm going to put the first dimension first. I'm going to put the third dimension second and then the second dimension third. Now let's just look at the size of this and see what we get. Oh, parenthesis problem here. Still a parenthesis problem. Uh, yes, whatever that is. This is what I meant. Okay, so now I have something that's 320 by 141 by 3. And let's go ahead now and pass this into the image sc command and take a look at what comes out. So um, what we're looking at, this looks very unusual, but what we're looking at here is a slice. So this axis here, on the, the x-axis is time. The y-axis is um, column index. And if you watch this video, it's a, it's a hand moving across and tapping the uh, bars on a xylophone. And so what we're seeing is as a function of time, the hand moves from left to right, and then it moves left and right again. So we're basically taking a slice through this video frame, or, or through this video, um, along, it's a very unusual thing to do, but we're looking, we're looking at a time space slice through this video. All right. So, so what this has done is illustrated both what the squeeze function does. It removes singleton dimensions and what the permute function does. It reorders the dimensions that are left so that we can put them in whatever order that we want. So again, those are very useful commands. And uh, that's what this slide is talking about. Um, a few more comments on multidimensional arrays. We can do arithmetic on multidimensional arrays. We can apply mathematical functions. We can round their elements. We can apply modulo operations, log, exponential, take the absolute value, all sorts of things. Um, other things that uh, we can do that reduce dimension by one is to uh, use sum, mean, standard deviation, and so on. I'll illustrate that here. Um, so let's let x be rand um, 5 by 6. And if I say sum x, it's going to add down the, the rows. If I say sum x comma 2, it will sum across the columns and give me a five-dimensional array. And th these same sorts of things can be done with multi-dimensional arrays. Notice that what goes in is two-dimensional in this case, and what comes out is one-dimensional. Um, if we passed in a three-dimensional array,
and we summed along the third dimension, we would get out a two-dimensional array. So here we, so basically these functions, sum, mean, um, and some of these other functions, they reduce the dimension by one. Okay, so for example, if we wanted to find the maximum element in a matrix, a three-dimensional array, we would have to call max, that would return a two-dimensional array, max again, that would return a one-dimensional array, and then max a third time to find the maximum element in that final one-dimensional array. All right. I'm going to stop the video recording here and continue in another uh, recording.